But we're going to read a verse found in the book of John and chapter 14. And so if you see what's before me, I'm reading from a Bible. I'm sure you have one at your home as well, or maybe on your phone, or maybe you just want to listen tonight, and that's totally okay. So we're going to read together from John in chapter 14 and verse 5. Now, Christ is speaking here. It's concerning heaven. I don't know if there's a person I've ever spoken to before that doesn't want to be in heaven. And Jesus is speaking about heaven here, and he says these words. Uh, he's going to prepare a place for you. He says, I will come again in verse 3 and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And um, he speaks about in verse 2, many mansions. He says, if it wasn't so, I wouldn't have, I, I, he said, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And so he's speaking about heaven. And so as you continue in John chapter 14, you're going to see a verse here uh, in verse four. And I'm going to start there and I'm going to end at verse six. And the words say this, and whither, Jesus is speaking, whither I go, ye know, and the way, ye know, Thomas saith unto him. Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So normally we've taken two words in contrast to each other, yet uh, working uh, together in the gospel. Uh, that's Dave and I as we share in the gospel. But this evening is just uh, myself. I'm just going to speak a gospel message that means the good news of Jesus Christ, the redemptive work found through Christ on a cross, what God provided to mankind through the person of Christ in Jesus Christ dying for men once and forever, being buried and rising again the third day. And because of that message, because of the message of Calvary, the message of Christ, you and I today can have eternal life. And so in this particular book here of John, there's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, John being the fourth gospel. In chapter 14, Jesus is speaking about heaven. He's just touching just a little bit about heaven. And then Thomas has a searching question for him. I love just in our musical PowerPoint, Colleen put it together, uh, this verse and, uh, and many other verses linking us to the gospel. But as I enjoyed the hymns today, I saw this verse, Jesus said to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father, but by me. The gospel is the greatest message that has ever touched earth. There's no message like the gospel. The gospel redeems man. The gospel reconciles men that are broken with God. There's a huge divide between God and man because of sin. And the gospel brings men together. It brings men united. It brings men uh, that were once away from God, and it brings them together because of the person of Christ. What the gospel is not is a pious, self-righteous message. That's not the gospel. It's not a politically correct message. It doesn't create some warm, fuzzy feeling because when we look uh, in the gospel, we look in the word of God, God speaks truths to men. And at times, even with uh, our own hearts and our, we just don't want to hear those particular truths. The gospel is not a prideful message. It's not a message that a, a preacher or a pastor gets up and preaches because he's filled with pride, because there's nothing that that person can ever do to inherit eternal life. We are saved simply by the grace of God. So there's no pride in our message. We are sinners saved by the grace of God. There's a day that I came to understand at 22 years old that I had sinned before God, that I'd fallen short of God's glory, and the wage of my sin was death. And I came to understand a truth that's found in the same book, actually, in John chapter 3, that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I rested solely in the work that Jesus Christ provided on the cross. He did that just for me, and he did it for you. The gospel is preaching Christ. That's the good news of the gospel. The good news is Jesus Christ came into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 says these words as he reflects on his background, on his pedigree, on, on how he was brought up, on what he did in his sinful life as the name of Saul. And the Apostle Paul now says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God, he says, 
unto salvation. First Corinthians chapter one says this for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. And so today, perhaps maybe you've never heard the gospel in your life. I just trust that with God's help today, you can understand one simple truth. And it's the truth that Thomas heard that particular day. Maybe there's someone on the call today and you're saying, Matt, how can I know for sure I'm going to heaven? Matt, I've attended church my whole life, but I'm still not sure on how uh, I enter heaven, how when time passes and eternity takes part in my life and I'm gone and I'm lost forever, where will I be? Well, Thomas is asking, how do we know the way? And the answer is Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man comes unto the Father, he says, but by me. And so the gospel is a searching message. It searches the soul. It searches us because God speaks about sin. God speaks about death because of sin, physical death, spiritual death. God speaks about in the Bible, a heaven above and a hell beneath, a great white throne, the lake of fire. He speaks about all these things. So when we speak in the gospel, we touch topics that are not our personal opinion. They are topics found solely in the word of God. The word of God is our authority. And the message of the gospel searches the soul. The message of the gospel is a seeking message. It seeks the darkest of hearts. Jesus told Zacchaeus, for the son of man, he said, is come to seek and to save them that are lost. We are all like sheep that have gone astray, Isaiah tells us. We've turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. So the gospel is not only a searching message as it searches our own souls as we self-reflect. It's also a seeking message and that Christ has come to seek and to save them that are lost. Are you lost on the call today? Never understood who Christ is, perhaps. Never understood that God so loved the world. He gave his only son to be the sacrifice for humanity forever. Today could be your night. You could come to understand this truth that Jesus is the way. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the life. And no man, Jesus says, come on, comes unto the Father but by him. It's also a separating message. You say, well, why do you uh, have three S's here? Well, it's just simply because sometimes it's easier even for the speaker to remember these things, but it's a separating message. John's gospel in chapter three and verse uh, 36 says these words, he that or she that believeth on the son, that's Christ, has everlasting life. In your vernacular, in my vernacular today, in our English language, he that believes or has rested on or trust in Christ has everlasting life. But the writer continues and he says, but he that believeth not the son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So it's a separating message. The gospel separates families. There are those within families that are saved and on their way to heaven. And there are those perhaps children or parents alike that are not saved. They've never come to understand what Christ did for them on a cross. But today I'd like to take up two S's with God's help. The first one is the gospel is a searing message. Sort of like if you're young on the call today and you've seared a steak or you have the thought of a hot iron searing. The gospel is a searing message. It sears the conscience like an iron. The gospel is also a sealing message. And I have the thought there of really your eternal destiny being sealed. So tonight we're going to take up searing and sealing. You think of searing in the gospel. You think of cooking a steak, perhaps. You think of the grease from the steak, the steak being so hot that you actually step back if you're sparked by it or if, you're, if the grease sort of falls on you. And you step back and you wonder what's happening. The gospel, when it's presented, it provides the opportunity for the sinner to, as it were, step back and say, what is God saying about my life in the word of God? I cooked noodles one time for my daughter. And as I was pouring these noodles into a plate, I'll never forget it. It was years ago. Uh, but uh, as I was pouring it, I was holding the pot, not thinking, and I was talking to her and pouring it. And as I was pouring it, the boiling water from the pot ran all the way down my arms. I couldn't let go of the pot because it would have hurt Hannah. And so I had to hold on to the pot. But I'll never forget. It was the greatest pain, physical pain, that I've ever experienced in my life. And I want you to think about that as the searing because when I stepped back, I had to look and really check out what happened and where I was hurt and everything else. Well, the gospel sears the conscience. 
It's like excruciating pain, as it were, because we learn Bible truths. Billy Graham in Sheffield, England, 1985, said these words. Every time I read the Bible, he said, any part of the Bible, it doesn't matter where I open up. It speaks to me. He says, why? Because the gospel, uh, the Bible, sorry, is a living book. And when we hear words like this in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23, it sears the conscience. God's word says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it sears our conscience. And it burns, perhaps, the sinner as they hear those words and they say, hold on a second. I haven't sinned. That. Well, the Bible says all have sinned. Some might say, well, I've measured up. I've done enough good works. The Bible says that we have fallen short of the glory of God. And the word says all. So as in all humanity. Not only does it start there, but think about the context of Romans chapter 3. It says, what then? Are we better or not? He says, the writer Paul's writing. He says, certainly not, for we have already charged that Jews and Greeks alike are all under sin. And just that is, as it is written in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. And it sears the conscience. The Bible continues, there's no one who understands. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned away. I'm reading from the New English Translation. All have turned away. Together they have become worthless. There's no one that shows kindness, not even one. Their throats, the Bible says, are open graves. They deceive with their tongues. The poison of asp is under their lips. You say, Matt, stop right there. My conscience is being seared. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery are in their past. The way of peace they have not known. Just moments ago, literally, just an hour and a half ago or so, I it was uh, uh, with my son dropping him off at another place, but there's a young boy who used words. And the word, at such a young age, the words that came out of his mouth were so filthy, so filled with darkness. It shocked me, frankly. He, he threw me off for just a second. The Bible's saying here, ruin and misery in their past. Their feet quick to shed blood. Their mouths full of cursing and bitterness. And the conscience is seared. The way of peace they have not known. There's no fear of God before their eyes. And then if you continue noticing, he says, for whatever the law says, it says to them, who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced. And the writer doesn't stop there in Romans. He says, and the whole world may become guilty under God. Seared. No wonder the writer continues in verse 27. He says, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what principle is the question asked? Of works? No, but by the principle of faith. Can I tell you today, as Jonathan Edwards said these words, you contribute nothing to your salvation, except the sin that made it necessary. And through the word of God, as the conscience is seared through truths that are found in the word of God, God is trying to take the sinner and point them to the person of Christ. That's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I love what one preacher once said years ago. He said, many books inform, but only one book transforms. And I'm speaking from that one book that transforms, and that is the word of God. And by that transforming power, we can understand the searing words that God provides to you and to I. Born in sin, hearts shaped in iniquity, living in darkness, blinded by the God of this world, hearts desperately wicked. Who can know them, the writer says. Romans 6 and 23 says, not only does it stop there, he says, for the wages of sin is death. I love this verse. But that pivotal word, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I am the way, Jesus says, the truth. And the life, no man comes unto the Father but by me. Wages, well, you and I were born in sin, and we die because of sin. Physical death, yes, and spiritual death. The Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. There is only one person who could ever endure the searing pain of the Godhead's judgment over sin, and that's the person of Christ. And Jesus said, That's why I am the way, he says. I am the truth, and I am the life. No man, he says, comes unto the Father but by me. Can I take you, dear friend, to a place called Calvary, where the Lord Jesus Christ went, and he allowed men to nail his hands and to nail his feet. He allowed men to spit on him. He allowed men to place a crown of thorns upon him. He allowed men to raise him between heaven, where he came from, and earth, who he was dying for. And God the Father poured judgment and wrath onto his only son. All for you on the call today. He died the just one. For us, the unjust. He allowed sin to be placed upon him, although he had no sin of his own. 
and he paid for sins once and forever, past sins, present sins, and future sins. And that's why Jesus is telling Thomas, Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. I'll tell you, man doesn't like to hear what we've done anything wrong. We never like to hear that. But God says, there's not one that does good. No, not one. And that's why, dear friend on the call today, his son had to come so that through him, man would have life. Man's ways are good works. Man's ways are tithing, perhaps, perhaps giving to the poor, perhaps praying to a statue, perhaps attending church, perhaps praying for the possible release. I hope this is not you. From purgatory into glory. There's nowhere you see that in scripture. Perhaps men dressing up, acting, behaving in a church in a way that pleases men, just hoping to get to heaven. I could take you to a highway between Obrago and Mexico and Hermosillo. People, thousands, crawling over 100 miles to pray to a statue, just possibly in hopes of entering heaven. God says, not by our works. God says, it's through faith in the person of Christ that we are saved and are on our way to heaven. The Bible says, there is a way that seems right unto a man, but the ends there are are the ways of death. And God gave a way, and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, he says, comes unto the Father but by me. In the olden day, we used to sing these words all the way to Calvary. He went for me. He went for me. That's Christ. He went for me. All the way to Calvary, he went for me. He died to set me free. And just in closing, let me just touch on the sealing of the gospel. Not only the searing of the conscience through the gospel, but the sealing of the gospel. I will tell you this. Once you're sealed in Christ, or you're sealed outside of Christ, there are many things that are done in life that can be corrected. Schooling can be corrected. You could fail in your grades. You can always correct it. You can go to school late in life. You can always correct it. Jobs can be corrected. Perhaps you took the wrong job in your 20s and in your 30s, you can fix it. Bankruptcies can be corrected. Divorces could be corrected. Interpersonal relationships and the shattering and breaking of that can be corrected. But I will tell you this. The decision between trusting Christ and rejecting Christ in eternity has no correction. Once one trusts in Christ, they are engraven. The Bible teaches us in the palms of his hands. They can never lose their salvation. When one rejects the gospel, they perish outside of Christ. They are lost for eternity. A solemn message. The gospel tonight could seal your eternal destiny. It could seal it by coming to him and being accepted in the family of God, or it could seal it by being re rejecting him. The Bible says, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for you don't know what a day will bring forth. Death is no respecter of persons. I could take you to a little place in Los Volcanes, Mexico, without getting in much detail over the phone. But I know a Sunday school teacher there, as he was waiting for boys and girls to run up the street, the little dirt street, I've stood right there. There was a little boy that said, I will be right back. He was going to give his verses at 12 years old to the Sunday school teacher. And he ran back just down the road, just a ways, and there was a bridge. And he decided to jump into a well-known pond or body of water that everyone jumped into, but it hadn't rained in a long time. And the boy thinking that he would take a jump and go back and uh, recite his uh, Bible verse to the Sunday school teacher took a jump and ended in eternity. I asked the question, where would you be? No transition when you leave time and enter eternity. There's no uh, warning signs. It's once you're here in life and then you're here in the next life. There's a river guide in the Zimbabwe, Africa, standing on a boat. And as he's going down the particular river, he's, uh, uh, he says these words. One second, he says, I was standing on the boat guiding a tour. And he said, without transition, with no transition, in other words, with no warning, the next second, I was halfway down the throat of a hippopotamus. He thought, for sure, I'd die. No transition. Friend, I'll tell you, if you step from time into eternity, only one thing will matter in your life. It won't matter how many shoes we have. It won't matter how many cars we have. It won't matter how many homes we have. It won't matter where where you went to school or what part of town you came from. It won't matter how big your bank account is or how small it is. It won't matter how many people that you and I have impressed. One thing will matter and it'll matter this. Are you saved? Are your sins forgiven? Do you have a home in heaven? Are you covered by the blood of Christ? Have you come to understand what Thomas is hearing from Jesus Christ? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Imagine going from dead in sins to alive in Christ right this second. Right this second. Delivered from the power of the enemy. Reception into God's mercy. Justified by faith. Declared righteous. That's what the Bible teaches. Redeemed. Purchased. That word is there. Purchased from the slave market of sin. Removed from being condemned. Under grace now. Not under judgment. Oh, it's just amazing.
to be saved, to be regenerated, to be born again, to be born from above, to have peace with God, to be forgiven all your trespasses, to have a heavenly citizenship based solely on reconciliation, based solely on what Christ did on a cross, given access to God. No need to pray to a man or through a man or for a man. God's word says you come to me just the way you are. Reconciled by God and to God. Eternally saved. Can never lose it. An object of God's love. An object of God's grace. An object of God's power and salvation. An object of God's faithfulness in coming to send his son to be the savior of the world. An object of God's peace. An object of God's consolation. An object of God's intercession. What does Jesus say to Zacchaeus? The son of man, he's speaking of himself, is come to seek and to save them that are lost. The Bible teaches that once someone comes to trust in Christ, they come to Christ just like Thomas came to the Lord Jesus to ask a question. You don't read of Thomas putting on a suit or you don't read of Thomas trying to impress Christ or showing up with a particular mode of transportation or some church attendance record. No, Thomas just comes to Christ and he says, Lord, how can I know for sure that I'm going to heaven? How do we know the way? Maybe someone on the call is asking that question. Can I tell you what the way is? Just through the word of God. It's right here. And it's all over scripture, friend. But it says this in chapter, Romans, uh, John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus says to Thomas, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. So it's okay. Let the conscience be seared tonight. That's okay. That's what God wants to do. He wants to speak to you. He wants to dive into the most prideful of hearts, break down the walls, and really get it to the root cause, the root matter here. We are sinners. We've sinned against God. And he wants to show you that you could be sealed in Christ through coming to the person of Christ. Why did Jesus come? He came to set people free. He says, I am not come to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. Jesus Christ came. He died on a cross. He shed blood to pay for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And He says, him or her that comes to me just the way you are, I will in no wise cast up.